War is upon us. Whether we like it or not, Elbert has recruited us to fight his battles for him. From the Dragonsong War to the campaign for Alamigo. But we have to take note of something first. Once again, job quests. However, as we discovered last time, we can gain job skills without coming back for quests. However, you still want to pick these up and do them at some point. They're also worth a pretty nice amount of EXP. If for whatever reason you fall behind on the level curve, this should be your first priority. Though I feel like nobody is going to fall behind at this point, even if leveling multiple jobs. Now is also a good time to note that job quests do not follow the same pattern of levels. Instead of every two levels, it now follows the Disciple of Hand and Land quest pattern. That is to say, level 63, 65, 68, and then finally 70. Clear up anything you have left with story, or side quests, or anything before heading back to the Rising Stones and prepare for a bloody campaign. A storm of blood. We have a lot of ground cover. Much like when we first entered Ishgard, one of the first goals should be the Aetherite, talk to your allies for tons of interesting flavor text through all the story quests, and get started on your journey. On your way out, you'll notice a chocobo keep, they're still a thing. But maybe it's just me, but these haven't been useful since Heavensward. Pop out your Aether Compass and get ready to explore. While some currents, potentially most of them, are easily accessed by following the main story with little to no exploring, it's not quite as clean as before. When we reach the Velodina River, there are two sites of note, neither of which being the tower in the cutscene. Follow the river towards the cutscene, and we see that there is a giant bug here. This is an A rank. A ranks in Stormblood are very rude. Heavensward had one or two annoying spawn points, but this is a whole new level. A ranks in Stormblood will actively get in the way more times than you might expect. If you're a Dark Knight, pray you have a friend around to distract it because your final job quest is right on top of a hunt spawn point. The other point of interest is to the north. No quest brings you here, except for maybe a generic side quest that won't be even covered in this series because it's a generic side quest. This should prove the point that currents aren't going to be as easy as Heaven's Word. But let's make our journey to the headquarters of the Resistance. Ralga's Reach. A holy place, and a fitting home for the Resistance. For the brave and the true the loyal sons and daughters of Alamigo. This is actually our new main hub. There's a red quest for crafters that we'll get into the, in the next video, an Aetherite system like Idleshire, a main and two smaller ones, and the most important bit, in here we have Rowena's House of Splendor! Oh, uh, uh let me just, uh, I said... Rowena's House of Splendors! Okay, so this actually is where the House of Splendors is, but not yet. You cannot buy Tome Gear until after finishing the base expansion quests. 
Come back after the credits roll and you'll have something to enjoy. For now, let me just say if you've been walking around like I was for pacing reasons, don't. You can mount up just like in Edelshire. The game will actively give you a tour of the Reach, giving you a chance to get to the mini Aetherites without actively chasing after them. And as you progress, we'll start getting more substantial rewards from quests. That being high quality gear again, just like Kevin's word. But now there is an additional option. Materia. If you have a crafter at 70 already, so you can meld your own gear for free without using one of the NPCs, this might be a good idea. Melding does add up in your damage output. And you can put this materia into your Shia gear that you should be wearing. Or do what I did and sell the gear for a bit of profit. But of course, I'm more experienced and you may benefit more from the materia, which you can still sell back later. Next, the game will warn you about Aether Currents, which is a bit late. But importantly, there is a new vendor to buy a new compass here at the Reach, if for whatever reason you got rid of your compass. Just in time for the story to split to two zones, just like in Heaven's Word again. We have the Fringes, which we already visited, and the Peaks. Before leaving for either of these places, visit the newest member of the Ironheart clan near the entrance to the Reach for our Stormblood upgrade to the Sightseeing Log. Just like Cavern's Ward, basically every entry has no time or weather requirements. Just reach the point and look out, or pray, or whatever. Just have better aim than I do? Then claim me a little bit of extra EXP. For, let's say special reasons, I head out to the peaks first. One of these is the fact that the story splits yet again. All of the quests must be done, but that there is a split within a split is amusing to me. One kicking a downed guy later, you may push south in your exploration only to experience a sheer cliff with aether currents on top. You cannot get up here. The southern half of the peaks is entirely unaccessible by normal means, as is the southeast section of the fringes. So don't explore too hard. Speaking of fringes though, is Raubon's Wall. The duty involved itself isn't very special until you consider that Stormblood's launch had a bit of a rough time. People began to form a line that went very, very far to slowly get people through Raubon's Wall. Instant servers were full to bursting, so nobody could get into the duty unless they were extremely lucky. Needless to say, the lines did not work. So I know full well I am giving people flashbacks when I say... <laughs> As like all my name days have come at once! One easy victory later, we can return for a little reintroduction to Arnvald. Remember when I told you to remember him? No? And take careful note of this man here. Remember him. He'll be important later. Well, I told you to remember him. One major story turn later, we'll be sent to Limsa Lomensa. But taking a stop over in the Castrum is a new blue quest for a current. This isn't special on its own, but what is, is the second quest in this series, is also blue. But there is seemingly no special reward. You can do these now, but I recommend not bothering until you gain flight. And we won't be back for the southeast section of the map for a very, very long time. Until then, this little clip represents all the currents you can obtain in these areas on our first trip. The rest of them are unaccessible normally. We will be back for these later, as I said. Finish any cleanup and be ready to set sail for your first glimpse at the staggering size of this world.
Welcome to Kugane, home of the hardest jump puzzle in the game, and hub for many a reasons. Our first big thing to note is a lore bit. Here we have Falcon Porters instead of Chocobo Porters. Before they took out the best quest in the game, A Realm Reborn taught us that there are no Chocobos in the Far East. At least, domestic ones. The story meanwhile seeks to show you the hostillery first. This is the home of that jump puzzle. Do enjoy. I expect you all to succeed. Passing beyond it though, is the main plaza. One Aetherite attunement later, I would also recommend making this your home point for the near future. Given the main story is currently level 61, we won't be leaving here until level 67. And if you have to teleport back, it will cost you a massive 1,000 gil for non-favored destinations. Intercontinental travel is not cheap. Theoretically, you could use the same boat you took from Limsa Lominsa, but you'll likely just want to teleport. So, give a home point here. Next to the Aetherite, though, is the Leave Meat of which you cannot interact with as a battle job. Battle leaves were so terrible, they no longer exist. Stormblood and Shadowbringers, and I expect Endwalker to, is just craft and gather leaves. There is not much in town for us right now, so continue the story until we're on the hunt for Gosetsu. There will be two quests when you pass by the Aetherite again, the first, next to the Aetherite, is the Shirogane Housing Ward. Hey look, there's my mansion! The second is on the way to Shirogane's entrance. Our new set of hunt boards. And because you're probably level 63 or higher like I am, there's at least two quests to get done now. Even if you aren't 63 yet, it shouldn't be too much longer till you are and can come back for a second level of hunt bills for even more free EXP and teleport tickets. Which for reference, there is now a clan hunt board back in Rogers Reach if you ever not want to travel to Kugane to get hunts. Keep progressing and you'll soon be able to leave to the next zone. But enjoy the sights while you are here. Stupid sexy row. There's not much in the Ruby Sea until you get to the first Aetherite in the north. You'll be sent further east to the Isle of Beko. Alice will tell you to search further inland. Many, many people seem to miss this and as the two of them walk in this direction, towards the entrance. And then if you take the time to get the Aether Current, you will be directly overlooking the entrance to the cave. Things always make sense. Trust the game and it will always guide you where you need to go. It is done. But spend your time helping the Kojin and get your magic spell on and become a monkey ball. Or cat ball in this case. Tilt your GameCube in the right direction and you can now dive underwater in zones with deep water. This only occurs in Stormblood and further areas. Even though you can swim in a Realm Reborn zone, none of them let you dive. You are then left on a mount, which feels just like flying, because it is. All mounts that can fly, which is all of them, can also now be used underwater. When surfacing next to an island though, Get as close as you can because you'll have to swim the rest of the way until you actually unlock flight for the zone. It's like all my name days have come at once. During your trip under the sea, you will meet Kuranai for the optional leveling dungeon of Stormblood, Shisui of the Violet Tides. Where Dusk Vigil was 51, this is 63. I point this out only to say it's not consistent between expansions. Also, if you have a fear of depths, get a friend to escort you. There is absolutely nothing that can hurt you underwater, but I know that some fears are blatantly illogical, and you have to go deep, 
deep down to get to Shisui. I had to help someone get to Shisui myself, so I understand the fear a little bit. But after completing Shisui, we have another quest that is unmarked, but is still special. All I'll say on this matter for now is, we'll come back to this next video. For now, finish up your efforts in the Ruby Sea, and we'll have some stuff while in Isari. There are two quests here, depending on what you have done before. The first is guaranteed to be here though, the Kojin Beast Tribe quest. Tama Mizu is now a hub of its own for the Tribe of the Divine Circle. The second unlock requires you to have completed Palace of the Dead Floor 50. If you have not, this quest will not show up until you do. This is because this unlock is for Heaven on High, the giant Jenga tower reaching into the heavens. This is the second deep dungeon of the game, for any jobs level 61 or above. It all basically works the same, with three or four new pieces involved that are interesting, but overall, it is the same. You can jump right in and know exactly how to handle things for the most part. But then, it's time to head over into Yangsha, the heart of Doma. How the talking stopped when we first set foot on the plains of Yansha. The big thing here is the game introduces its fascination with a new minigame type. Many side quests use this dart minigame, and even the beast tribes make use of this aiming minigame. Even a summer event used it, where you had to use it to spy on beachgoers. It upsets me that I can't get a headshot on these jerks. Later we'll get a full set of the gear for Glamour, and the quest requiring it to be worn. And Hrothgar can't use the helmet. Well, it's like all my name days. But one trip to Yangsha later, we'll have flight. But half the map is still not accessible, thanks to the moon gates. The northern half is impossible to get to by flight, which is why you can get it now. And I recommend you do get flight now for when we finally reach that northern section. But for now, two sets of blue quests just appeared in Namai, and you may want to do them now, but I won't be going too deep into why. Next video. But head to the Azim Step, meet the mole, and hear a prophecy. Cherish the stars and the light they bring you in the dark. For you are a traveler, are you not? Let this stew in your mind as we return to Kugane for the level 66 tier 3 hunt builds. Yeah, it's super early of an unlock, but we have all three tiers of builds already. One trip to the far east was all it took. Three levels lower makes a big difference. But speaking of not needing much, we have the Nottam. It's a huge brawl with a lot going on, but not really. Many people get lost here it seems, but all you have to do is just to watch for when you get told to push forward. Your goal is not to defeat all enemies, but to capture the Uvu. And your allies will tell you this plenty of times. Dearest of all his enemies, eh? Congratulations. It's like all my name days have come at once! With a new ally, we'll be on our way back to Yangsha. Quick note, if you did do the quests in Namai, your reward is hiding behind a rock. But we'll ignore him to get back to Yangsha. Remember? We have flight already, so make good use of it to liberate Doma. One liberation later, we'll get to visit the Doman Enclave. Make note of how run down this place is. We will be back. But we have the Western Front to return to first. With a victory in Doma, we have the confidence to strike back in the West and take back Alamigo.
With our first victory achieved, we have the southern half of the fringes now available to us, with more currents and quests and plenty of story. But we have something extremely important to note now, the level 67 trial. The Lady of Bliss compels you to go into your keybinds menu, the hotbar section, and scroll down to the bottom. Duty actions 1 and 2. Give these both hotkeys you are comfortable using mid-fight. This is not the first duty action you will have used. There was a quest in Kugane that had you use them. But it is the first you are guaranteed to use in combat. You are given plenty of time to activate Vril anytime it is required. But this can be considered the actual duty action tutorial. And yet, it's a punishing tutorial. Failure to use Vril is an instant death. Be ready to use these a lot in future content. Some of it, they're an extension of your toolkit. Hello, Bogia. But before heading to the peaks, we should now have flight available. However, there is now a new quest line with the Noon of the M Tribe. This is why I said to hold off on the Western quests, because the unlock from those is tied directly to being done with these as well. And since these become available after you have already unlocked flight, it makes sense. Either way though, whether you want the reward from this questline or not, I highly, highly, HIGHLY recommend finishing the questline for Tala. I won't say why, but it will become obvious later. This questline is actually important. But you'll know you've completed the questline when you reach the Rose Blooms twice and complete that. Brooding Broodmother, after all that, will have the all too familiar level sync symbol. This is our inn to the Bridge Club of the Ananta. The bridge went from Imperial Castellum to run by a bunch of old ladies playing cards in just a few days. But we can't remain here. We have a war to finish. Let's head on to the peaks. Once we've arrived in the southern half of the peaks, for our final few currents and our final fights. There is of little consequence here otherwise, just be sure to attune like normal and keep them eyes peeled for currents. Oh, and see how you are still just a pleb next to the true hero of the story? Thank you stars he is on your side as you enter the final battleground. Comrades brave and true, they had come from all across Eorzea to stand with us. To stand against oppression and tyranny. The Battleground of Aether Currents. This one is on a cliff. You must get there from the north, the cliffs above. The closest point, I believe, is the Psaltery. Otherwise, the next closest point is all the way back by the Aetherite. There's also this one to the north on a bit of a wall. To get on top of this wall, you have to get from above, which is through some crypts. There is another entrance to the crypts on the east, which is safer, but I always enter from the southern entrance. I warned you at the start that this wouldn't be as easy as Heaven's Word. One more note though, when Lys tells you to dive underwater, she is telling the truth. A lot of people get lost here as well despite the marker pointing down and saying you have to go into the water. But with all the hurdles overcome, every difficulty overcome, we reach the third and final wall. We took Baelzar's wall, defeated the Moon Gates, and now we break through into Alamigo. It's time to end Xenos' reign of terror. But of course, going inside now would be a bit too early. There is a minimum item level of 280, which is super easy to reach. I made no attempt to use any of the free high quality gear for my accessories on Gunbreaker, for no purpose but to prove the point of how easy it is to get 280. 
between the quest gear and the dungeon drops, you'll meet this. But there's more. There's job quests to do. Multiple jobs will have you pass through Kugane for their quests, so while we're here and level 70 already, go grab the B-rank hunts, otherwise come back here when you have time. More importantly though, the reward for the 70 quests, even for Dancer and Gunbreaker, is a skill. Ones you really want. There is, however, a rub. If you are a Gunbreaker or Dancer, item level 395, you are expected to, much like Samurai and Red Mage, have a set of level 70 Poetics gear. Normal mode is definitely 100% impossible at your current item level, and Rowena's isn't open yet. As a result, lose your first match, use it to study the fight as far as you can, then turn on very easy mode. This is the only reason I will ever suggest something like this, just because it's literally impossible otherwise. Samurai and Red Mage? At least you already had options for better gear, and Rowena's was already open. But after quest completion, we'll get our new skill, and the same come back later message. But with a new twist. Instead of saying you will have to finish the final quest of Stormblood, it will say you have to complete the quest Shadowbringers, which is the final base quest Shadowbringers has. That is because job quests are done. We'll go into more detail about this when we get to Shadowbringers, but yeah, you don't have to worry about getting skills from quests anymore. And they're not tied to gear either. But back to the other job quests, anything that isn't Dancer or Gunbreaker, and probably also the Endwalker jobs, will have a normal sync point of just level 70 instead of item level 395. And I had to fail this quest too, because I forgot to record footage of this menu. But for all these other jobs, a skill is not the only reward. We also get a coffer, just like in Heavensward. This is our set of Stormblood Artifact Armor. Item level 290, which would easily push us over the 280 requirement for Alamigo. But it won't push us over the requirement of wearing a hat as Hrothgar or Viera. This depressing fact in mind, go. Go and claim your victory. End this tyranny. With those who shall find glory, with those who will fade. For you are a traveler, are you not? In crimson it began, and in crimson it ended, and then, and then we were free. Thank you for joining me through this bloody campaign, your first day at war. The first may change, but our goal ever remains the same for this series. Two nations freed, two nations left to rebuild. And rebuilding requires materials. So just as before, next time we shall explore the new gathering and crafting options for Stormblood. Rest now, hero, for in time the work must continue. And may the power of Ananid Hogs lay waste to your enemies.
And a special thanks to all of my patrons over on Patreon. And an extra, extra special thanks to... Arya Deva, Eamon Al-Khatib, Benjamin Han, Body Clock, Ethan, Ethan Olson, Evan, Jamie Cutterell, Kyle Steinhauser, Meowfy, and Valor LLC. If you'd like to join my Patreon or join the public Discord, the links are down below. Thank you for watching and have a good day.